All right. Let's pray first. Heavenly Father, this morning, again, I, I want to thank you for your, your love and your grace. And I pray that you be the teacher this morning. Help us to unlearn things that we've been taught that are incomplete. And allow your Holy Spirit to bring truth to our hearts and minds. So we can see your love bigger, better, wider, and deeper than we ever thought. I pray you impact our hearts and minds today. And may it impact our lives. Amen. All right. Can I have control? Please. Uh, yes. Holding a grudge is letting someone live rent-free in your head. I saw that sign not too long ago, and I thought, hmm, just think about that. This, this whole series is called Healing Life's Hurts Through Understanding Forgiveness. I think this is a huge, huge issue in all of our lives. Individuals we need to forgive, have forgiven, are still processing forgiveness, all those kinds of things. And today I want to deal with a really, really big one, probably my f most favorite if it's not my favorite part, it, it at least was the most impacting part to me when I began to unlearn the myths of what I thought forgiveness was. I think it's the greatest hindrance to forgiving others. If we believe these myths that I'm going to share with you, there's no way we can cover them all today. If you listened to it last time, which is a number of years ago, uh, there's been some additions and changes. Uh, but these myths are real. People do believe them. They may seem like they're similar to one already covered, but they're distinctly separate. Because it's funny how we think. Let me give you an example. When I was at camp, and you can't imagine this, I was considered rebellious. I was considered as one who would not listen to authority. Ugh, I don't know where they get that from. And it took one man to ask me some heart-to-heart -heart questions and then to discover I wasn't trying to be rebellious intentionally. The leaders weren't being good leaders. <laughs> Just kidding. No, it, it had to do with their wording. They said, we'd like you to put those hay bales over there, but they never told me to. Do you hear it? We'd like you to do that. We would rather you do that. Well, I don't care what you'd rather. I, you, I still get to do this one. So the wording gave me choice, and when that was revealed, I grew up one more step. Because now I was now responsible to hear wording and intent better. But the leaders were using these words that I gave an out to somebody who was finding the loopholes. And the list I'm going to present to you are loopholes to some people, keeping people in bondage, showing they cannot forgive because they're locked into a false understanding. Wading through the myths and incomplete understandings of forgiveness, only to find out that our mythical definition never did mean true forgiveness. And that's what I want to unpack. I would normally use the word lies, but lies is sometimes the intentional uh, act of trying to deceive. And that's not always true. Uh, I've taught incomplete truths in the past. And uh, I continue to grow, and I hope we all can continue to grow. So I want to read this. Don't worry, it's not for you to read. Uh, it's there, so I remember to read this. And uh, um, I'm going to ask Sarah, if you, when I'm done this last line, you just go to the next slide, just to caught up. I want to read this to you. I, we read this on Friday morning to the morning coffee group, and uh, I think it fits with this series in a profound way. I meant to read it last week, but the sermon would have been even longer if I did. So anyway, here we go. On Forgiveness by Steve McVeigh. When Adam sinned in the garden, he wrongly assumed his God would be angry. But instead, God came looking for him to take his regular evening walk. When Abraham sent his wife Sarah into Pharaoh's tent to protect his own life by allowing her to have sex with another man, God told Pharaoh that he was on dangerous ground and he'd better get out of there right now. The next words out of God's mouth to Abraham were to reassure him of the covenant he had made with him, not a word about sin. When Elisha was depressed and afraid and angry and prayed to die, God sent an angel to feed him so that he might regain his strength. No shame and no blame. When Peter denied Jesus, our Lord made sure when he arose 
to mention Peter by name and said to make sure he knew Jesus was alive. No reference to what Peter had done. These were giants in the Bible, giants who made horrific choices. In each instance, the love of God swallows up their sins and foolishness in one great gush of grace. It's absurd. What have you done that causes you to think God may be disappointed or perturbed towards you? Whatever it is, you need to set it aside because that's what he has done. As absurd as it sounds, God isn't interested in what you've done in the past. He lives with you in the now and wants you to live in this moment of grace and accept his forgiveness. Jesus showed us Father's heart when he had the father of the prodigal son throw him a party. When he returned home without so much as a mention of what the boy had done, that's our God. Refuse to accept his acceptance and you'll lock yourself inside a prison of your own making. Accept his acceptance and you'll run in the joyful freedom only known by those who know their sins never appear on God's radar. Never. You've messed up? (laughs) Welcome to the world of great children of God. It happened. So put it aside now. Don't insult the finished work of Jesus on the cross by insisting on trying to share in dealing with it through your own gnawing guilt and spiritual suicidal self-consciousness. You are forgiven. You are free. You are the one with the one who keeps no record, you are one with the one who keeps no record of wrongs and promises to never remember them again. So dance, run, laugh, play, celebrate. That's what the Father, Son, and Spirit are doing, and He asks you to join in right now. That is a message from your Father, your Heavenly Father, to your heart. This is available on the back table for anybody that wants them. I will post it later this week. But it's a message of grace we need to hear regularly. You may have been told, you must forgive, right? We've been told that. The Bible says you've got to forgive. And then they club you over the head with that because you are not able to. They make you feel guilty and feel like a piece of dung. Not fair. If forgiveness is that powerful of a force, we need to understand what forgiveness is. But if we're ever going to understand what forgiveness is, we must wade through the errors first and get rid of it. So we're dealing with a clean understanding. Does that make sense? Let's filter the water. There are contaminants in there. So number one, and there are 18 what forgiveness is not. (laughs) It's not proper grammar, but you know what I mean. Forgiveness, number one, is not minimizing the hurt. Okay? What does this mean? It, mean, it, it does not mean that when you forgive, you imply that it's okay that others have hurt you, or pretending I've not been hurt, or you're not taking the wrong seriously. So there's an idea of, yeah, it happened, but you know what? It, it, it's, it's not, I'm not, it doesn't hurt, I'm fine. Or it's okay. You know how some people are martyrs? You know, I'm just, I'm just with one with Christ. I'm suffering his burdens. This is my lot in life. You know, it's the, you know, if Jesus took the cross, I can handle this pain of this person. Do you hear it? Okay. Forgiveness is not minimizing the hurt. Forgiveness is not the absence of pain or hurts. Huh. It does not mean that once you have forgiven, the proof is that you won't feel hurt or pain from what's happened. Some people have said, I've forgiven, but why am I still hurting? I thought I was going to feel free. I thought, hey, I've done the deed. Now the magic Harry Potter wand goes, poof, now you feel better. Ooh, I forgot. Did, what, did somebody hurt me? It's not like that at all. But some people think because they still feel the hurt, oh, maybe I haven't forgiven then. It is definitely possible to forgive and still feel hurt. We'll come to that. That, that will be covered in this series. And you're going to hear it interspersed throughout each of these, well, not every one of these, but throughout each section of the series. Forgiveness is not the absence of pain. It does not mean that once you have forgiven the proof of, oh, whoops. Did I just do a double? Okay, sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> forgiveness is not easy. This is a big one. 
It is not easy. It's one of the toughest things you will do in your life for certain hurts. For some hurts, sure, it's easier, but it's the level of pain that you've been hurt. And we have stories right here this morning, and those watching online have come from horrific hurts and are still being healed. It feels like a part of you is dying, and a part of you is dying. It's not easy. Protective coping mechanisms build up, and you walk in anger, bitterness, hurt. Sometimes for years, it's become part of you, and that part needs to die. You've given life to the hurt by keep remembering it, as in reattaching it and not forgiving. There's a freedom that comes when we do forgive that releases that association and you move on to authentic healing. It's not easy, so just don't be whipping it out there saying, ah, come on, just forgive, it's easy. You just say the words. Really? Hmm. Forgiveness is not about time. Because this little myth jumps in and says, time will heal all wounds. How many have heard that? Baloney. Oscar Mayer Wiener. Remember that? No, never mind. Baloney. Time, what it will do, it can do one of two things. It can take you ignoring it and bury it deeper and deeper and deeper. And the more time that comes and builds, the deeper it goes unaddressed. But the attachment of the memory, and the emotions attached to the hurt are not forgotten. The event may be, but not the triggers. And you'll be triggered by many other things throughout life, and you won't realize what has been built up into this cavity of memories stuck in a hidden spot. Some of you have been hurt as a young child, And that young child threw on an unbelievable coping mechanism protection thing because our bodies are wired to do this when extreme hurt and trauma come. A protective cone or a bubble, whatever, and that little one hides away and becomes a quiet voice in our thinking, speaking to our ego of who we are. I'm still hurt. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I'm a nothing. And that voice stays, but the protection hides deeper and deeper. And when that protection hides deeper and deeper, (laughs) that little one needs to still be healed. In a sense, caught up. This is something I'm learning now. From when I was 7, 11, a whole bunch of stuff, and thank goodness for wise wisdom from counselors and such. But that little boy I've been having to speak to, I know it's weird, it sounds so strange, you know, I talked to this little kid way back, and, but trust me, every message of what I've believed is right there loud and clear. It's not gone. But now I'm starting to call out and say, hey, Mike, seven-year-old Mike, you are a good kid. You can come out now. You come out of that bubble Walk through some of the pain, but it it will lead to healing. It's time to come up from the depths of the sea and burst forth of the top like an air bubble in the ocean. Big breath air, breath of fresh air, and watch the little guy heal and catch up so I believe who I really am versus the multiple messages of all the hurts. Can you see that? Does it make sense? Am I explaining it well enough? It's real. Not everybody experiences it. Many do. And maybe some of you don't even know you've experienced it and wondering why you're triggered by certain things. Very good likelihood there's some healing that needs to take place. Interesting. Forgiveness is not forgetting. This is a huge one in the church. Well, you still remember it, so obviously you haven't forgiven Because if you've truly forgiven, you would have forgotten it. Because the Bible says you'll forget it. Well, not true and not true. Both. Am I trying to pretend that everything is fine? Move forward with my life 
and not bring this matter up again? Is that what I'm going to be doing now? I'm just going to forget it. La, 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 la. And I'm going to focus on the tree, the tree, the tree. Meanwhile, the hurt's right here. And I'm just going to forget it. I'm just going to overthink over here so that that is not in the forefront of my brain. We do that. It's called protection. Especially if the trauma is serious. The Lord is compassionate in this Old Testament. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. And please, folks, get this part straight. Slow to get angry. Filled with unfailing love. Old Testament, Old Covenant. And it still says unfailing love. Now, you do hear mixed messages in the Old Testament. I'm going to go with the one that reflects my loving God, okay? It gets better. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. What? It's there. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. From us as far as the east is from the west. Removed. And we covered that two weeks ago of how he has put away sin far more bluntly than this. And there's another sheet. The sheet's still out there if you want those verses to go look them up yourself. So it's not Mike telling you, but the scriptures are showing you clearly you are forgiven. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. You want to talk about a model parent? This is your heavenly father. Not all earthly fathers are like that. They can change. They may not, but this is your true father who influences every parent. So when your mom is compassionate to you or your dad is compassionate to you, it's your heavenly father being compassionate to you through them. He uses people to love people. Hebrews 8, 12 says, For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. This is Hebrews, new covenant. He chooses not to remember. We talked about dismembering your, your arm and what happens if uh, they take it off and they put a prosthetic, they, um, then they put a prosthetic on it. It's not the real one. But let's say the accident happened fast enough and they were able to remember, reattach the arm. Your sins will never be remembered to you. Never reattached. They are gone. They are forgiven. This, that was the biggest mind-blowing thing for me to believe. Remember, we talked about always having to stay forgiven up. It was my job to keep asking God over and over and over and over. Anyway, that's two weeks ago. Go back and watch. You may be carrying guilt for something you've already been forgiven of. (laughs) That was me. I didn't know I was forgiven. And when I discovered that, when I believed it, Now all that baggage, listen, you carry around luggage long enough, it starts to hurt your arm, okay, or your back, and your your bones get sore, you creak, okay, you ain't normal, your body just doesn't act the same way, so when you release it, it doesn't instantly go, boom, I'm back to normal, no, it's like, oh my goodness, I gotta start believing this and start acting like it's true. Now I start to put into practice working out my salvation, work out what is already true of you out in activity, performance. Yeah, I said that word, and it's okay. That's what it means to work out your salvation, not work for it. Hello, it's been given to you. Now enjoy it and experience it. You may forget, by the way. It is possible. You may forget, but that'll be a byproduct. It is remembering the pain and still choosing to forgive. That's the beauty. It is cruel to tell people that if they haven't forgotten, then they haven't forgiven. May that never come out of anyone's mouth here. Ever. Because it's just not true. Does that make sense? 
Forgiveness involves the act, an act of the will, a choice that you make at a certain point in time. Once you've done it, you've done it, regardless of how you may feel, regardless of if you forget it or not. By the way, you're going to hear later, forgiveness is both an event and a process. Just saying, just stay with me on this. Take a look at this. The cost so we praise God the glorious gra- uh, for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. With his blood, he purchased you, your freedom. And then he forgave you. The blood didn't cause the forgiveness. The blood was the purchase of your freedom. (laughs) Forgiveness is not a feeling. What a feeling. Uh, Okay, I don't sing much, but really, feelings, feelings, nothing but feelings. Okay, like it's not about the feeling because some people live from their feelings. They live from emotions. Emotions and feelings are not who you are, but they're a bigger part of you than I ever gave credit to. Years ago, I dismissed, uh, okay, Uh, how do I say this carefully? I was dismissive in my tone in how I approached how our feelings work with facts. I was incomplete. Wrong. (laughs) Our feelings sometimes jump in to protect us when our thinking isn't acting right. Our emotions do the same. However, our emotions do flow from what we think about. A lot of science behind that. Some of you may say, well, I don't feel any angry anymore, therefore I must have forgiven them. It must have happened in me. You know, I kind of, forgiveness kind of was a, just happened. You know, it's like food digests. It goes in and then, there, you know, it's processed. There. The forgiveness is now processed. No, no real effort. Hm, I feel good. I'm satisfied. The truth is, forgiveness is about an act of the will, not feelings. Feelings can constantly change. You can count on them. There are times where, yes, anger builds. Memories cause an emotional reaction. While you have forgiven somebody, you may come to a moment of being reminded of it again in a very not nice way for whatever circumstance you're going through, and your emotions are evoked but you've still forgiven, and the Holy Spirit's job is to call you to that attention. Say, you don't forget, you have forgiven. Allow the motions to process. Allow it to flow out. It's It's a moment of time. Let it happen. Don't assume that once you forgive, you should automatically feel good. Say, dear Lord, I forgive them. Hallelujah! And you're all happy? Really? No. No, it doesn't happen like that. So forgiveness is not a feeling, just in case. Forgiveness is not being naive or ignoring it. There are people who will bury their head in the sand. Hey, listen, you've done it. I've done it. Okay? It's not uh, (laughs) plugging your ears going, hee hee, monkey, no see, no do, no whatever. This is a big, big deal. It's not ignoring it. Sometimes you may say, well, I'm able to separate the person from their behavior. You know, I can compartmentalize what's happened here and just deal with them. You know, I'll just leave that over there. Well, that's ignoring it. You, you, you're doing that as a self-protection if you recognize that. Trying not to think about it only masks what your emotions, soul, and the hurt part of you needs to deal with. You still need to deal with it. Even if you're one of those people that are all about peace. You don't like confrontation. Honestly, no one likes confrontation. Even those who like to debate... I don't, Laura, if we, if we got into it, I'm kidding. She's a teacher. You're poor kids. <laughs> most, most people, most, uh, don't like confrontation, especially when it's a negative one, when it's like bad. They like debate. They like to get into it. And there are per- certain personality types that like to argue. That's not the same thing. It's not. But how do we cope with this? How do we feel? How, how do we address these things? 
trying to think about it only masks the problem. It will come out in some other ways. Your body is trying to cope with a deep, deep pain in your life. It's designed to heal itself, and it sends triggers. So what happens uh, with little uh, Harvey in the hospital? Why is he there? Why do you think? Give me a scientific or uh, medical reason why he could be in the hospital. He's not in the hospital right now, by the way. He's back home. What, what would cause mom and dad to go, ooh, we got to call the doctor? Tell me. He's not behaving normal. Uh, temperature's going way up, let's say. Fever, sign, or you know, all that stuff. You know, that happens. You're throwing up, you know, uh, which is not normal. So you have all these things going on because the body is saying to you, this, there's something wrong here. Something is going on that shouldn't be. And that's what happens with our emotions. When stuff gets piled up and built up and poured down deep, even small stuff, because all that small stuff adds up to big things. Your body, your physical body, knows. The cells in your body have memory. That's freaky tiki to me, okay? I would not have believed that a couple years ago, but now I'm starting to see with physics and science, like, holy smokes, there's more going on than I ever dreamed of. This is critically important. Next. Forgiveness is not justifying, excusing, or explaining away the offense. And I have heard this one happen so many times. I have done it. And this means... If we're doing this, we truly do not understand what forgiveness is. Again, that's why I'm nailing these things that it's not. You cannot say, it's no big deal, I just need to move on, or use these kinds of excuses. Please tell me if you've used these. No, don't tell me. Oh, they're not feeling well. You know, they're sick, so you know we'll let them get away with that. That's why they acted like that. They're not feeling well. Or they were under stress. If you knew what they were going through. Um, or, I, I must have misunderstood them. It's me. I just, I took it the wrong way. I'm Canadian. I took offense. <laughs> they weren't a believer. <laughs> How dumb is that? Really. But I've heard this in the church. Well, they weren't Christians. So, we have to, you know, they, they don't have the light of God in them. Therefore, you know, they, they, of course, they act like that. So dumb. The light of Christ is in everything and everyone. Don't give me that. <laughs> On their, oh, their difficult upbringing. That's right. Look at, the, look at the parents. Ooh, that explains everything about that kid. Or, or do you know what I'm saying? Like you, you're excusing all these behaviors. Oh, their difficult circumstances they're going through. They're going through a divorce. They're going through uh, somebody just died. Oh, oh, oh. And we excuse the offense. Oh, I wasn't hurt that badly. Minimizing it. Well, I'm overreacting. By excusing and rationalizing away with these types of comments, we are really minimizing their responsibility. I hope in this series I get to tell you about my confrontation with my mother while she still had her faculties up here going. Called her to be responsible for all of her actions. What a nasty, nasty time that was. Romans 2, 14 to 15 says, Even Gentiles, non-Jews, who do not have God's written law, show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience, and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they're doing right. No one is without excuse. It's so much easier to give an excuse because then we don't have to deal with it. Suddenly, this topic is becoming not so much about what forgiveness is, maybe it's revealing something about us and where we need to grow up and mature. 
Don't mistake in compassion for, forgive, for forgiveness. Like if somebody goes through some tough stuff and they do some stupid things. And you can be compassionate, but it doesn't mean you can get away with it. I can be compassionate to people and kind and still hold them to account for what they've done. I understand why you did what you did. It was still wrong. When we don't call it out, we participate in the problem and attach ourselves to the pain without even knowing it. If I'm able to minimize the abuse that was done, then it minimizes the amount of hurt that I bear. Hell no, I don't want to admit what a pain I'm going through. Because if I have to admit it, that's a heap load of stuff I gotta walk through and deal with now. I don't want to do that. It's been more comfortable having it stuffed. I'm not ready to. Lori will tell you this. When I started my counseling a couple years ago, the real heavy duty stuff, it wasn't pretty at home. I didn't think it was that different. <laughs> it wasn't good. I became more agitated. My pendulum from not arguing went to, I need to learn to get my voice out and went way too far. I started arguing, speaking my mind, which is not always wise. But then something else happened. This is pretty transparent. I've probably not told you this, but I was also running away from having to deal with certain emotions and feelings. So much so that Lori noticed, and I had to talk to my counselor about it. I had been overusing alcohol as a way to diminish pain, to mask it. And I didn't know. It was turning, you know, I, I, I like my beer, and I always will. That's the way it is. <laughs> but through counseling, I right away discovered, and I was set free instantly, like at that moment, when she said, this is a vice you're using to prevent yourself from feeling, because now all this counseling is bringing up all the drudge. All these compartments are coming up and out. And they need to be healed. And it's, it looks ugly. It's like cleaning gold. All the crap on the top has to be scooped up regularly until it's totally pure. That's what was happening in my soul. It's a lot longer process than anyone wants to admit. And we run to different vices. Overeating, overshopping, gaming, you name it. All these things do not feel. People, those behaviors are not the problem. They're a symptom of a problem. Be careful how you shout out at your loved ones. Recognize and have eyes to see there's something deeper going on. For the activity you see on the surface, that's just the surface. Come a long way since then. Healing's a process. And I learn from each step. If I don't learn from each step, that problem will cycle itself over and over and over. If I'm able to excuse the behavior, then what they did to me doesn't appear to be as bad as it was. <laughs> we are made in the image of God. We were never meant to be abused at the hands of another. The truth is, the offender knew better and chose to hurt. Do not let them get away with it. But it begins not so much with calling them out as it is you learn how to forgive first. This is big, folks. Don't, don't assume I'm saying now you got to go confront. No, 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 no. Please don't do that right now, okay? That's not what I'm saying. This is about you as an individual first discovering what forgiveness is, learning how to forgive so that you come to a place where you can actually confront in a healthy way. Otherwise, you do it from anger and revenge and all kinds of toxicity that you've not dealt with. That's not a healthy way to confront. Do you hear that? Please? I'll cover it again later, but it just came out of this. When you and I realize that, and only then will we be able to own the pain, which then and only then will lead us to release it through the crisis event of forgiveness. And it is a crisis event. It's big. It's not easy. It's not simple. 
Smeads, author, I've referred to him in the past, he wrote this. Recalling the pain of being wronged. Recall the hurt of being stung, cheated, and demeaned. Doesn't the memory of that fuel the fire of fury again and reheat the pain again and make it hurt again? Suppose you never forgive. Suppose you feel that hurt each time your memory lights on the people who did you wrong. And suppose you have a compulsion to think of it constantly. Nobody here does that. You will have... Uh, you will have become a prisoner of your past pain. You will be locked in a torture chamber of your own making. Time should have left your pain behind. <laughs> Lie. But you keep it alive and let it flog you over and over and over. Your own memory is a replay of the hurt, a videotape within your soul that plays unending reruns of your old rendezvous with pain, and you cannot switch it off. You are hooked into it like a pain junkie. You become addicted to your remembrance of the past pain, and there are many I know who are. And you are lashing each time your memory splits, spins the tape. And I would ask, is this fair to yourself? This wretched justice of not forgiving? You could not be more unfair to yourself. The only way to heal the pain that will not heal itself is to forgive the person that hurt you. Forgiving will stop the reruns. Forgiving will heal your memories and change your memory's vision. When you release the wrongdoer from the wrong, you will cut a malignant tumor out of your life. You will set a prisoner free, and what you will discover is that the prisoner was yourself. Forgiving is tough. Excusing is easy. What a mistake it is to confuse forgiveness with being mushy, soft, gutless, and oh-so-understanding. There are people that are living in the spin cycle and they like it. They hardly have friends. And whenever they do connect, all they do is give their moan story of all their pain, rehash. How are you doing today? Oh, you know. Yep, I know. See you later. Don't be that. If you're in that cycle, If you're not sure, ask somebody you trust and be ready for a real answer. You may not like it. It's time to be who you are. Come on. Come on, Schmucker. Hang on. All right. Sarah, I'm going to need your help. Here we go. When you and I excuse the behavior of what we are really doing is trying to protect ourselves from admitting the pain that we bear, we cannot do that. If you do, you will be locked in the bondage of unforgiveness because the sense of violation is still going to be there. It's not going away. The only way to do this is to own the pain and all the reality that there was. Once you own it, you can then give it away. Once you admit, I've been hurt, then you can actually forgive. Otherwise, you have nothing to admit and forgive. You're masking it. If forgiveness is that powerful of a freeing force, then the evil one will do all he can to keep people in that bondage of unforgiveness. John 8, 31 says, Jesus said to the people who believed him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It does not say the Bible will set you free. The truth. And who is the truth? Jesus. This is big. Okay, we're not going to deal with that one today. Number nine is next week. Folks, this is big. It's deeper than I ever expected. And having to reteach it now, it's kind of blowing my mind again. It's like, oh, I forgot some of this stuff. Oh, I see it a little differently now. Oh, wow, look at that. It's kind of exciting. It's revealing. I'm sharing my journey, hoping that you can find permission. Somebody told me that the other day that I was able, because of what I shared there, felt free and had permission to entertain their journey. I went, cool. Okay, if that's what's going on, I'll be transparent. I know who I am in Christ. I know my union. I know I'm loved. I'm free. I'm pure. And I want to act like it more and more. I definitely haven't got it perfect. (laughs) 
But the Holy Spirit is prodding me, and he's teaching me to listen. Not so much do, but listen, <laughs> which is very different, because the church will tell you to do. Here's the list of five things to do to make your marriage better. Here's 10 steps for your kids to make them uh, non-hyper, you know, whatever. Like, yeah, as if. But Jesus says, come and rest and know me. And he knows you. Forgiveness is possible. By the time we're done this series, you will see, I guarantee, forgiveness is possible. Regardless of what your reservations are, please stay with me on this. There's some heavy-duty stuff still coming, especially next week. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, you are the healer. You are the initiator of the process. You've invited us into the process. Some of us are still at the starting gate, not sure if we trust you. Will you cause our belief to trust you so we can begin or continue, if you've stepped off the path and sat on a chair in the sidelines, to walk further through the journey of healing so that our union life will come out in a very real way. That's light shining from, from us, not darkness being emulated. Be our teacher. Be our revealer. And you are also the end. You are the result. And if I see you as the result, okay, I'm good with that. As long as I keep my eyes on you and not all my faults, pains, and hurts. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching today's message. I hope uh, it was encouraging to you and inspiring to you. Uh, if it is, if this uh, uh, channel, this uh, YouTube channel is encouraging to you, would you consider making a donation, especially year-end? We'd love to have some support uh, to make this message uh, go wider and farther. Uh, if it has been encouraging and you uh, are encouraged by what you're hearing, then make a quick donation down below. Uh, it'd be a huge way to uh, show thanks and uh, encourage us to keep going the way we are. That's all. Uh, Click on the links below. Thanks.